gender. Gender is a big and complicated thing, and any honest exploration requires acknowledging the fact that gender, either the roles assigned or even what genders are provided as options, change based on time and culture. However, when people talk about culturally specific third genders, they tend to think about indigenous in groups, assuming that the West has possessed a solely sex-determined male-female system until the modern transgender movement. But this isn't the case. In fact, the Talmud provides for six genders, and modern Jewish communities need to acknowledge this if they can ever hope to provide a welcoming and inclusive community for queer Jews. So, what are these additional genders? Well, unlike a lot of other cultural third genders, the Talmud still dictates that gender is entirely sex determined. Rather than making a space for what we would best perceive as non-binary people, they are instead intended for intersex people. Because in reality, even if you only focus on physical traits, there will still be many people who can't be classified as male or female. In our modern society, these people are typically forced into one of the permitted boxes, which usually involves non-consensual medical procedures. However, in a culture where sex always equaled gender, the sages did not willingly blind themselves to these exceptions. So they acknowledge additional genders based on the kinds of intersex conditions that can be externally noticed. And the vast majority of the mentions of the other genders in the Talmud are regarding how gender-specific laws are to apply to these people. This is treated like any other kind of edge case that the Talmud comments upon. The first of these genders is tum-tum. These are for people who lack external sex elements and are typically seen as having a hidden gender. In general, they are ruled to have to fulfill the obligations of both men and women. On screen is a non-conclusive list of mentions of tum-tum in Jewish texts. The next is androgynous, which does come from the Greek androgynous. As you can see, the tum-tum and the androgynous are usually mentioned together. The difference between the two is hard to make out, but basically an androgynous possesses ambiguous genitalia with both masculine and feminine characteristics, rather than having hidden sex characteristics like a tum-tum. They are typically ruled to have to fulfill neither of the obligations of men or women, such as always being able to enter the temple, regardless of their ritual purity status. Usually androgynous is translated into English as hermaphrodite. Both androgynous and tum-tum are sometimes used as non-binary, although not necessarily intersex gender identities by modern Jews. Unlike androgynous or tum-tum, saris isn't a gender one can be assigned at birth. Saris are people who are assigned male at birth based on genitalia, but never develop male characteristics and or develop female characteristics at puberty. Unlike how some modern Jewish trans women identify as saris, the Talmud treats it as a subtype of male. Intersex saris, who developed like I just outlined, are known as saris hama. Eunuchs were also considered a type of saris, a man-made one, or saris adam. Because of this, saris will often be translated just as eunuch in English. As you can see, the sages had less to say about saris. Al yonit is the last gender and is the opposite of saris. It was for intersex people who were assigned female at birth, but never developed female characteristics with puberty. Once again, they were considered a type of woman by the sages, while some modern trans male Jews identify with the term. Now, anthropologically this is interesting, but you may be wondering, how is this relevant to modern Jews? Well, the sages didn't just talk about the extra genders in the Talmud when it came to halakh. They also used it in their Midrashim, and by acknowledging and teaching that some of the most important ancestors to the Jewish people were interpreted as not entirely male or female, modern Jewish spaces can help make non-binary people feel welcome. When Adam was first created, a Midrash states that they were first made an androgynous, so the first person to ever exist was intersex slash non-binary. Then, when Eve was created from Adam, she became the first woman, and Adam the first man. Sarah and Abraham were originally tamtamim, and that's why they were infertile. When Hashem gave them the ability to reproduce, they made them male and female, respectively. There are two more similar midrashim that don't track to either the Talmudic gender system or the modern trans-inclusive understanding of gender, 
but they still demonstrate a kind of flexibility in gender and sex when divine intervention is at play. Leia is stated to know that there were only twelve tribes of Israel to go around, and so far she had given birth to six of Jacob's sons, and the concubines four between the two. So if her next child was also male, Rachel would only be able to bear the progenitor of a single tribe. So Leah prayed to Hashem, and her fetus was transformed into a girl, Dinah. A Kabbalist text states that Isaac was born with a female soul because of Kabbalism's cycling of souls, and that when they were about to be sacrificed, they gained a male soul that allowed them to impregnate. That doesn't make the most sense to me, but this text provides a choice opportunity for a trans reading. This kind of knowledge, while it can help promote a core understanding and acceptance of gender that goes beyond modern Western society's male-female only sex-determined gender system, it is only the first step. Next comes the more concrete actions. Now the acceptance of binary trans people only takes one simple step. Just treat them like any other member of their gender. When things get more complicated, is with non-binary genders. Chesed, an organization that promotes LGBTQ plus equality in Jewish communities, has some very good resources online about creating inclusive Jewish spaces. Some steps community leaders can take is adopting gender neutral versions of prayers, having gender neutral restroom facilities, and most importantly, making it clear that bigotry towards other members is not to be tolerated, and that bigoted members of a synagogue are to either be quiet or to leave and find somewhere else. The kind of policy changes necessary for a space to be non-binary inclusive will be specific to each individual organization. However, one thing that will apply to all organizations is that leaders cannot wait until they have a known queer member to dedicate themselves to inclusivity, because if someone isn't assured that they will be safe coming out in a certain setting, they are unlikely to do so. Therefore, before an organization has a known queer member of any kind, a clear policy about not allowing bigots as members will have to be in place. You will have to be the one to take the first step to let us know that we are safe in your spaces. I hope this has been a good introduction to trans, and especially non-binary, Jews in both modern and ancient times. As an agender person, this is a cause that is especially close to me. On screen now are some resources for further reading on the topics discussed, and direct links will be provided in the description. Thank you for listening.